to this afternoon's talk. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to um, welcome Kathy Bertini back to the Ford School um, in our new digs, quite a bit different than where she was before. Um, I first met Kathy when she was running the food stamp program for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the first George Bush administration. She went from there to an appointment as the executive director of the United Nations World Food Program, which is the largest um, food relief and assistance organization by orders of magnitude um, in the world. And she was absolutely instrumental in a whole variety of food relief efforts from North Korea to Ethiopia to um, things going on in Eastern Europe at that time, and, and really was known as an incredibly effective director of that program. Um, she was time limited out after 10 years, and we lured her here as our very first Towsley policymaker in residence um, at the Ford School, where she taught a class and spent the entire semester here, and I know a number of you here in the audience met her um, at that point. Um, she left us to go back and become essentially the um, um, Chief Operating Officer for the United Nations, so your official title, Under Secretary General for Management, which meant she was, you know, in charge of running the place, not a, um, not an easy job. As, as uh, what one person said, you know, what's more difficult than solving world food is running the United Nations. So um, um, she did that for a number of years um, and has now decided to uh, go back into the academic world and is professor of practice at Syracuse University, which is close to her home. Um, she lives in Cortland, New York. And um, from there, I know, travels all around the world doing many interesting things. Um, in any case, it's just an absolute delight to have Kathy back at the school this afternoon. And she is going to be speaking about humanitarian actions and um, the circumstances under which they can and cannot be effective. Join me in welcoming Kathy. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be back here. And it's so it's so wonderful to see this absolutely gorgeous facility that you have. And I give congratulations to the dean and to the university and to all those who participated in making this uh, beautiful place for a very impressive public policy school. Now you have the facility that you deserve. It's a uh, far cry from being crunched up in Larch Hall and, uh, and the other places. I'm sure Larch Hall is wonderful, now more wonderful, that it has more space for whoever is there now. So salute to the dean. And it's so nice to be here and have a few moments to see other friends and colleagues with whom I worked uh, when I was here in the fall of 2002. And also to see Mel Levitsky, whose office I now sit in at the Maxwell School uh, since he's come here to the Ford School. You know, when I was here, I so much enjoyed teaching that I said to myself sometime, I'd like to do this again. And so when uh, I was recruited to join the faculty at Maxwell, I was really pleased to do it and to be able to go home. But I, I haven't left you far behind because I have hanging in my office there at Syracuse University the University of Michigan t-shirt that the students gave me, <laughs> all autographed. Uh, and uh, it's hanging on my bookshelf um, uh, there in my office. Also, I remember, I saw Bob Axelrod earlier, and I remember his being right on, um, I'm, I'm sure many times, but two that I remember in particular was in a, in a brown bag lunch he did for the faculty talking about what might happen if there was a war in Iraq. And he had all various scenario that might occur, and they all seemed fairly rosy except for one, which was guerrilla warfare in the streets. And I said, oh, well, that's not going to happen. And he said, well, it's one of the options, and unfortunately, or one of the possibilities. Unfortunately, he was right. Um, but he also did say um, what Becky just said, that um, when I left to, uh, and knowing that I was going to back to the UN to be in charge of management, he said, yes, I think maybe the only thing more difficult than solving world hunger is managing the UN. He was right about that, too. Uh, we haven't solved either one of those uh, challenges. But today, I'm here to talk about humanitarian action and, as the flyer said, saving lives, facilitating change, and working toward peace. And humanitarian action has really become much more than saving lives, although that's its basic premise. It, it, of course, humanitarian action is, is as old as, as uh, societies are. We all go out of our way to help people who are in need, and particularly those who are in need because of a disaster, a natural disaster. Uh, uh, it could be as small as that their, their basement is flooded and as huge as that their country is flooded and uh, that there's absolutely no place to live, no place to work, no place to go to school, um, no place to be able to be safe. And of course, that does also include 
war and civil strife. As we look at what has gone on in humanitarian action, though, in the last 15 years or so, we see a huge change in both natural disaster, the numbers of natural disasters increasing, and at least in the decade of the 90s, a huge increase in the numbers of disasters that were, are considered man-made disasters. Now, I maintain that the latter has been, was in large part because of the uh, fall of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall, and as a result, there were so many more uh, ethnic battles, so many more boundary changes, border changes, and at least for a while, a considerable amount of unsettlement uh, around the world that caused many more uh, uh, humanitarian catastrophes for people living in those areas. But also, as far as natural disasters are concerned, there's been more than a fourfold increase in natural disasters, particularly floods and droughts, uh, in, in, um, in the last 15 years. And of course, global warming is considered one of the main reasons for these uh, additional uh, problems that people have had throughout the world because of floods and earthquakes and, and, um, and droughts. When we look at all of those, we look at really a new almost industry that's grown up within the United Nations and throughout the non-governmental organization community for organizations working to help people in need. For instance, the United Nations in 1992 create, well, with a resolution of December 1991, beginning in 1992, created uh, a Department of Humanitarian Affairs that became uh, now the Office of uh, uh, Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or OCHA for short. And their responsibility is to supervise the, the coordination, really, of all the, the major humanitarian disasters around the world and try to have non-governmental organizations, UN agencies, governments, all working together as they work to help end people's suffering. There's also been a uh, proliferation of NGOs around the world uh, to help work on disasters, many more NGOs searching for funds to increase their work uh, for disaster relief. And, of course, a big change as far as the United Nations organizations are concerned on ability of UN uh, organizations to work on disasters. For instance, at the World Food Program, we used to be mostly a development agency. And even, as, even in, in 1989, two-thirds of the work of the World Food Program was helping deliver food to peaceful, in peaceful countries to people living in peace but in poverty. But it changed very swiftly, and now 90% of the work of the World Food Program is for essentially humanitarian relief, disaster relief, relief for people who are living amidst natural or man-made disasters. It doesn't mean that uh, there's not a great need of people living in poverty uh, who are hungry, but it means that f the first priority for the international community has, begun so m has become so much helping people who are cut off because, from food because of natural or man-made disasters. And that's really where the humanitarianism comes in as opposed to development. There will be soon published a book called Humanitarian Diplomacy, published by UNU Press, that's UN University Press, uh, edited by Larry Manier, who was with Tufts, and Hazel Smith, who uh, is uh, with uh, a Professor of International Relations at the University of Warwick in the UK. And essentially what they do through a bunch of contributors of, of, by contributions from individuals who worked on humanitarian relief, they make, the, they make the point through their stories that there's now something that they call humanitarian diplomacy and that are helping people to live through disasters, the saving lives part, has really expanded because in doing so, though that's our absolute commitment to save lives, we end up, we being humanitarian workers, end up being diplomats. Not diplomats that are, that, went, that are in the State Department career path, not diplomats who have learned how to be diplomats, or diplomatic for that matter, uh, but, and, and not people who, who, for whom diplomacy is their main line of work, but it becomes almost a natural progression in so many, in so many of these problem areas around the world for the relief workers, the humanitarian workers, to end up being diplomats in, be, by doing their humanitarian work itself. And in that process, to help facilitate change and, and, and in many cases to help working toward peace. And what I'd like to do today is to take three examples of where 
we saw during the decade of the 90s uh, and into, in, into this, uh, this decade of where humanitarian work turned into di diplomatic work or at least laid the groundwork for really important changes that occurred in the future. The first I want to talk about is Southern Africa, and in particular the drought that affected Southern Africa in 1992. And in that drought, which you have not read about, I can guarantee it, because no one covered it. Uh, it another thing, I think, that shows how humanitarian relief has become so much bigger lately, there's, there's hardly a, a, a disaster now of any major impact that you don't read about or watch on television. But this disaster in 1992, which, which potentially impacted on 16 million people, was written about, to my knowledge, only once, and that was in an article in the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, and uh, however, it was a huge disaster, which, uh, because of the drought over several years, was hitting the 10 countries north of South Africa in this region, well, including Lesotho and Swaziland. Uh, in, within South Africa itself, and this, uh, in, in the territory itself. And um, this drought was having a major impact on essentially the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Then Zimbabwe was still a uh, stable uh, country and was really the country that sold the most, produced and sold the most uh, wheat uh, in the region and was critically important for the region. But all throughout that region, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, a grain that was grown and sold uh, uh, throughout, and there, that was no longer existing now because of this drought. And the whole region was, was hit by it. We were afraid that so many people would, would starve because of a lack of food. And this was the beginning of the Department of Humanitarian Affairs operation at the UN, and they said, well, in the, this is a drought, therefore people aren't going to have enough food. So one of their first assignments was to assign the World Food Program to be responsible to be the lead agency to get not only food, but assist, with, assist UNICEF in providing assistance for water, um, assist other agencies in providing help with agricultural development and health concerns and so forth in this area. And we saw that so many people uh, potentially could be helped by a, a coordinated effort organized by the UN. But one of the problems was that there weren't any ports that we could use in the countries that were at risk. In Angola, um, first of all, it was at war. So even the, port in, the ports in Angola aren't very big to begin with, but we couldn't use Angola as a staging point, even for Angola, let alone for the rest, all of Angola, let alone for the rest of the, rest of the region. In Mozambique, there are a couple of ports. Mozambique was at war. Uh, and the ports, again, although could serve some of Mozambique, certainly because of the war, we couldn't use that uh, very well either. And the infrastructure didn't uh, serve to be very uh, supportive to, for the entire region. The, in uh, Namibia, the port isn't, wasn't big enough to, uh, to be able to serve. So you can clearly see what the option was where the ports were that were big enough uh, to where the capacity was in order to move food into the region. They were in, South Africa. Apartheid was the way of life in South Africa. So the conventional wisdom was, and in fact operations up until then were, you can't operate out of South Africa. But we had a, a long discussion about this and said, well, wait a minute. People are going to starve because we can't move food, because we can't use the ports and the railroad systems in South Africa because of apartheid. Now, what's wrong with this picture? And what we did was say, ask, we asked for representatives of each of the countries, of Botswana, of uh, Zimbabwe, of Zambia, of Lesotho, of Swaziland, and also of the countries on the coast, to come together for a meeting to say, how can we solve this problem and what can we do? How can we, how can we help um, children like him be able to uh, live through this crisis? And the answer was through the South African railways. Uh, a very sophisticated railway system from the ports um, in, um, in South Africa that could actually come up to the northern points of South Africa and then move through to the other countries, if that was allowed. Uh, there were other issues as well, though. One of the issues was the, they, call gate, they call the tracks that railways want to run on gauges, or at least they have gauges as, as the measurement of how far apart the rails are. 
And there are different size gauges between South Africa and the other uh, countries, much as there is between, for instance, the Soviet Union and Western Europe. So, um, so that was an issue as well. Uh, and that meant that you had to have an incredible amount of coordination because you just couldn't run a, 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 an engine through. You had to not have another engine on the other side to offload uh, and, and load up again uh, to be able to move um, through uh, the rails through the system. So what we did was set up an operation in Johannesburg, and this was a guy who was giving us a briefing when we, when we came to visit there at one point in that operation. Um, and we had one person from each of those uh, 10 countries that were affected by the drought working in Johannesburg with obviously the agreement of their governments. They all worked in Johannesburg and they were there to ensure that the process worked. We didn't work with the government of South Africa, though obviously they um, uh, uh, tacitly agreed to it. We worked with the railroad um, system and with the port system. And since we had railroad experts from each of the countries, um, the countries in the region in Johannesburg, they could follow it through. They kept the whole process honest from their own perspectives. And, uh, and then they could help ensure that the, that the, uh, the food really went through and got where, uh, to the uh, borders where, where it was needed and then moved through in order to uh, feed people throughout the regions. It was a hugely successful operation. As I said, it wasn't covered by the press. Um, and, um, and, I'll, and some people didn't want it to be covered because they were afraid people would then criticize us for operating in South Africa. Uh, I would rather be criticized for operating in the South Africa of that time than for sitting there and saying we can't and having so many people unable to have food. And instead, we were able to provide food to camps like this where uh, people were living in displaced persons camp where they would have uh, uh, rice and beans in this case uh, that they'd be able to, to serve to each family. We were able to provide food in schools. The school was in Angola. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, have the children eat uh, there at school. Of my whole 10 years at WFP, this was my favorite picture. From a, um, uh, from a displaced persons camp in Mozambique, I wanted to take that boy home, but his mother didn't think it was a good idea. Uh, other people have since done things like that but, and gotten criticized for it, by the way. But anyway, uh, um, this was a displaced persons camp, and uh, we were able to, in, I'm sorry, in Mozambique, and we were able to uh, uh, get food to them. And then this is in your brochure, actually, but in Zimbabwe, uh, we were feeding children in school a high-protein mix that they were, they were eating. Now, why was this important um, it was afterwards? It was important afterwards because uh, of the relationships that were created between um, the technical people in South Africa and the technical people with those countries. So that as soon as apartheid ended, um, the fact that we had we had essentially created the system to be able to move across the borders, and 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 learned how they had learned how through this process, that 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 was a generator that was able to be put in place immediately to be help promoting commerce in the region once those countries um, had the ability to um, trade um, officially and legally with South Africa. Uh, it isn't just my opinion, although, again, there's not much written about it, but if you go back and find the, the guy who was the head of the uh, Department of Humanitarian Affairs at the time, who uh, since uh, then what has become the president of the UN General Assembly and the number three in the foreign ministry of the government of Sweden, um, people like him will say this absolutely um, was a, a important contributor to commercial development post-apartheid. Uh, and it certainly was a contributor to keeping people alive in South Africa at the time. Next region I want to go to is, um, well, a country, North Korea. And uh, North Korea, um, if you're, uh, of course, it's been in the news a lot lately, and I'll come to that in a minute. But um, if you recall, North Korea has mostly um, two borders with South Korea and with China, although there's a very small, as you can see in the, in, in the northeast corner, uh, border with Russia as well. Um, the, um, you all know the story of North Korea. Um, let me tell you what, what I saw, uh, a couple of things firsthand. Uh, but first, say that in 1994, um, North Korea came to WFP and said, we've had some problems um, with the weather and we need some assistance. And we said, well, what are the problems? Well, we had a bad hailstorm. And WFB had had some issues with North Korea before where they 
were very misleading about wanting help and then not cooperative about what they were going to do on their end. So nobody paid much attention to them. But in 1995, they came back and said we had another bad uh, storm and it really hurt our agricultural area. So we said, all right, well, you ask in a timely manner, we'll check. We, we, we sent a mission. They found out, yes, indeed, the, the most pr productive agricultural area of North Korea was impacted by uh, uh, some bad uh, rains, and so um, they were in need of some food f because of what was produced in that particular area. Uh, but once we started working there in 1995, uh, it didn't take very long before we realized that the problem was much greater. The reason why it was so great is because in um, North Korea, the people actually rely on the, um, the government for their food. It's a socialist uh, society. And, and except for the people who are farmers who are allowed to keep part of their uh, production, everyone else goes to the, essentially the, the government store once a month and gets their food to bring home. And that amount that, is, that they're given uh, per capita was decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And what they would do, the government would say, well, the, the government has decided you don't need as much food anymore, you're stronger, you don't need as much food, and it would just be decreasing and decreasing. They used to be supplied beyond their own capacity to grow uh, uh, food, which is not enough to feed themselves, no matter what they do. They used to be supplied by the Chinese and by the Soviet Union. So after the end of the Soviet Union, that whole supply ended, and that was a major reason why they had less and less available for them and for the people. And as a result, they had less and less available for themselves. If you're, if you're familiar at all with the peninsula, you know that the south has always been more productive agriculturally than the north, and the north is fairly rocky. So agricultural experts will say that they can't grow enough, if, even if they wanted to, they can't grow enough for the whole population. Even if they used all the, all, let's, well, let's assume they, they want to, but they don't have modern agriculture production, even if they, they change to much more modern agriculture production, they can't produce all that they need. So, um, so they always have to import in one way or another, and, and they either don't have the capacity or have not chosen to, to import enough food for uh, all of their people. So we decided that there was a great need here in North Korea, and they w we would actually need to have additional um, food come in to the country. And it, it's a formula that, that we use with agricultural experts to make a, a, essentially a per capita assessment uh, uh, based on the 22 million people in the country how, um, and, and multiply that by a, a certain formula, come up with how much the, the country would need, subtract from that how much they produce, how much they import, and then, and then the deficit we, we, try to, we try to help meet. That was essentially the idea. When we first went into this business, we had no idea what anybody would think about it. In fact, we, for this 1995 small area uh, where their agricultural land was uh, impacted, we asked for a program for um, about $9 million program, which was very small for WFP. We had no idea how we were going to have it be funded and whether or not my government or others would say we were crazy. But we thought they need it, we're going to ask for it. So I called first the Swedish ambassador, a different Swede than the one I referred to before, and said, you've given World Food Program some cash that we can use anywhere where we need it, and I'd like to use it for North Korea. And he said, well, why are you asking? This is a good donor. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, why are you asking? We gave it to you who said no strings attached. So OK, thank you very much. So I used uh, for North Korea about two and a half million dollars. And, uh, and then we got some small contributions from Australia and New Zealand. But then the U.S. came through with $2 million. Then we knew we were okay. We knew we'd make our goal. And we knew we would also be okay politically. And they had to go through their own hoops because it was, in terms of being able to donate for North Korea because of American law at the time, but they made those changes so that we could um, uh, move food. By the way, at least during my time at WFP, the only time we lost a ship at sea was the ship with the U.S. bought food on it on its way to North Korea. And it was Thai rice, and the whole ship went down in a storm. And we were, we were self-insured, so we were insured for the ship, but unfortunately, uh, many people lost their lives on the ship, the crew, which is a North Korean crew. But that caused a political problem, because there then became press over having lost the ship 
And I was concerned, of course, about people saying, why are we supporting North Korea? Instead, the, the, the issues were from rice growing Congress. Man, I mean, congressmen from rice growing districts in the United States who said, how come you bought Thai rice? How come you didn't buy American rice? So that was okay too, I mean, uh, for, for a problem rather than why are we there at all. Uh, but we began there uh, on, a, on a small scale in North Korea um, and then uh, we realized that we had to grow that program because it's very desolate there. This was. This is a better off um, uh, farming uh, community, better off because they have um, the oxen that can pull the cart, um, and many of them didn't. Uh, the first time we went there, the first couple of years we went there, the, the, even the oxen that we saw were very skinny. We didn't see any birds, we didn't see any little animals. Um, I, all, it, it was a famine, and people, people didn't have enough to eat. Certainly the uh, small animals didn't have enough to eat. By the way, sometime later I went and I, to one of these villages and saw a woman with several dogs um, uh, in her um, pen and I thought they were pets. Silly me, you know what they were for, um, their food. Um, but uh, anyway, this th is a very desolate um, place and, uh, and as, you, as people had less and less food, of course, they had not ability to, to grow. Um, a lot of people work in the fields, a lot of the factories are closed uh, and the spare parts and the, and the scrap has been sold to Japan or, or, or others. So there were many people available to work in the fields, but of course to do this kind of work you need to have a fair amount of sustenance in order to, in order to work uh, successfully uh, in the projects in the field. The schools that were, were uh, the schools and the hospitals were some of the uh, worst um, places. But some of, the, at least the schools, ended up being our, the best way to get food through. Because we had to use the government systems in order to move food in once you got the, to the food into the country. Uh, and so there was always the issue of the follow-up and is the food getting to the right place. We had a couple of ways of ensuring that. One was feeding children in school because we could see children who look like this one, uh, when they started. And then we'd see more and more children go to school once the food started coming. And when our monitors went back to these schools, they could see these very same children who were much, uh, much stronger, uh, in better shape. And also, um, they could, uh, there were more children in the schools because more children were sent to school once the, once the food was arriving. Also in North Korea, in the kindergartens, they, they serve hot meals. They have little kitchens in, in the kindergartens. And, it's, it's not what you and I would think of a kitchen, but they have a, a way to cook hot food. And so as a result, the littlest children got hot food at school. Uh, and, uh, and we were able to feed them, feed them that way um, um, in the school system. And it was one of the ways that we could ensure the food actually got to the right um, places. Uh, another thing was that we, that we sent um, although this girl, this was not at the very beginning, and this girl is eating rice, at the very beginning, the uh, Japanese sent a lot of rice, but at the very beginning, we didn't uh, send rice. We sent wheat and corn, and uh, the North Koreans preferred it because they could, for the same value, you could get much more wheat or corn than you could rice. And th uh, that was one of the indicators to us that they were in grave shape, otherwise that everyone would prefer rice. Uh, but also, the military's first option was rice. They didn't want wheat or corn. So it was another thing we knew from the very beginning and that other governments uh, would confirm with us that our food actually was, was going to the people that we thought it was going to. And then we ended up with, um, with cakes, little cakes like this, this little boy has. Uh, and uh, by the way, my husband is a photographer and he took all of these pictures and this one was, it was on the cover of Asian versions of Newsweek um, during the North Korean crisis. But we ended up putting a lot of, um, uh, of a mixture of food together, refitting factories and being able to make little little cakes for the children to, to eat. Some of them it, it, it ate them at school, some of them brought them home. But again, we delivered them only to school and we worked with them only, only in the schools. The hospitals were a different situation and the situation hospitals in North Korea, I think you become sicker if you go to the hospital than you were when you were sick enough to go to begin with. Um, but we found that um, when our monitors went over and over again to hospitals that they, the food wasn't really getting to the hospitals. They, it, it looked like they were putting it there so we could see it when we were there. Not, it wasn't the same kind of consistency as there was in the school. So we, we ended up stop feeding in hospitals, um, as difficult as that is, but we just didn't think that the food was staying in the hospitals.
this this is some of the kind of um, work projects that to go on. They were they were building uh, rice paddies here and taking and taking uh, muck out, but they were just huge. And they they have bands that play mar martial kind of band music to to keep up the beat while you're working doing this kind of work. Um, and uh, and well, that was at an orphanage. Uh, very uh, tragic there. Why is this important? A couple of th a couple of reasons why beyond the saving lives that we did. Um, but first, uh, World Food Program has only got a very small operation there now. Um, why? There's still a great need. The Chinese are still providing food. But now the South Koreans are essentially, I'm not sure they would like this description, but they've almost taken over where the, where the Russians, where the Soviet Union left off. Um, they're providing the uh, bulk of, of food assistance that's needed to the North, and they're doing most of it directly. Uh, and um, so the North is, is more stable, but they still need to import this food, and the, primarily it's coming from, from uh, China and South Korea. So at the end of 2005, North Korea said, thank you very much, international community. We really appreciate what you've been doing, uh, but we don't need your help anymore. And that was, this is why, because they now have it from, from other places. So, it's not great, well, it, it, there's the good news that it's not a famine. It's not great news. It's not like they've totally changed their um, methods of operation. Um, but at least they're stable and they don't need this big, all, all this international support in order to uh, help keep them that way. Uh, and, um, and why wasn't South Korea there before? Well, because they didn't speak before. They, they didn't speak at all. Um, uh, in any way, shape, or form. And I can tell you, the first time that I went to Seoul was in 1997, a couple of months after my first trip to North Korea. And I brought with me a videotape that we, we, we uh, had done during our, our visit to North Korea. And I was mobbed everywhere I went in South Korea. Uh, we had a press conference and we showed the videotape. And on TV that night, there was videotape of the videotape of what I was showing about what was going on in North Korea. Uh, in my hotel room, the, 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 the phone rang off the wall from reporters who wanted to talk, who didn't have enough time, even though we spent a lot of time talking to the press about what was going on in North Korea. We had meetings with NGOs and hundreds of people coming to talk about what was going on in North Korea. The government, the government listened to every word we said. And by the way, Ban Ki-moon, during one of my trips, I met him uh, there now. He's the Secretary General of the UN. But, and, and by the way, when I met him at a cocktail party in New York in December and introduced myself and, thank, and congratulated him for his new job, upcoming job, he, first thing he said, oh, what you did with WFP in North Korea was so important. And um, uh, so, but my point is in 1997, in Seoul, nobody had been to Pyongyang. And, and there was very, very, very little interchange between North and South. Uh, and and it's my belief that one of the one of the things that helped make that change was uh, humanitarian action on the part of the UN, WFP, UNICEF, and others, that helped to um, help build a, an atmosphere in South Korea, which then Kim Dae Jung built on when he had the Sunshine Policy as the new uh, president of, of South Korea, and started opening up relationships with the North. Uh, this humanitarian action helped be able to do that. But it didn't just help with South Korea. Um, it also helped in, with other countries as well. And it, all of a sudden, in, uh, when I was working on, on uh, North Korea issues, uh, North Korea started to be very aggressive trying to work with other countries to get recognition of other countries. And um, uh, just between, and if you look at the list of what countries recognize North Korea, you know, who exchanges ambassadors with North Korea, um, you'll find that, it, that um, few, you know, every year there might be one or maybe every couple of years one that a new uh, relationship with North Korea. But from 2000, just in 2000 and 2001, the following countries recognized North Korea. Australia, Philippines, UK, Belgium, Italy, Turkey, Netherlands, Canada, Spain, Luxembourg, Germany, Greece, Brazil, New Zealand, Kuwait, and Bahrain. What's going on here? Uh, again, I maintain that the, the humanitarian action, which opened up the country, at least in some small way, helped open up the relationships uh, 
with all of those countries who had sent staff, humanitarian staff there, who sent missions there to review what was going on, who became, who, who never had had anybody there since the war, who are now creating relationships with the government of North Korea. Now, North Korea is still a very problematic uh, country in terms of um, what it, is, it does or perhaps threatens to do. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to say it, the issues are fixed and that everything is fine. But the fact that there is this interchange that didn't exist before, I think, can be in large part um, uh, goes back to the humanitarian diplomacy that was created through these actions. And if we have time to talk about it in Q&A, um, I, I have a, a graduate student who has some other theories about um, some of why South, or North Korea is doing what it's doing, but that um, will take away from, from my point here. Now, the, the last um, area that I'd like to talk about here is Afghanistan. And there are two different kinds of um, issues in Afghanistan that I, I, I will address. Uh, first of all, we all know far too well now where it is. And, and, and when I was here uh, as a Towsley Foundation uh, scholar, I ended up talking about in my speech that time, why wait for the uh, why wait for the next Afghanistan? Uh, and essentially made the point that there could be many other countries like this uh, that are desperately poor and that are able to uh, support somehow, um, in this case, terrorists who um, uh, would terrorize, literally terrorize the world. And of course, my answer to that was more aid and more understanding. But um, um, Anyway, I talked about Afghanistan then, and one of the things I talked about then was that we had to do a lot of work there even while the Taliban was uh, in charge. Uh, World Food Program had been in Afghanistan for 20 years before 2001 and had been working in the, in the country, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, and uh, a country that had, of course, been through war with the, when the Soviets were there. Uh, as well as uh, having then a terrible drought in 2000-2001. Um, and, and then when the Taliban came in um, in the mid-90s and put out the edicts that women couldn't work, girls couldn't go to school, women couldn't leave their house without a blood male relative, we, we at first nobody believed this was even possible to be true. When we found out it was, WFP and UNICEF together worked on a strategy to be able to change our programming and say, if we're having programs to save lives, then it doesn't matter what we think about the government. We have to save lives. But there are programs to help with development. Then um, the international human rights ought to um, be prime. And in this case, if girls, for instance, aren't going to go to school, we're not going to feed, we're not going to send food to the, to the children in school, to the boys in school. To that, the Taliban said, well, but boys are important too. We said, yes, they are. But um, so are girls, and, and we will feed girls and boys. Uh, and uh, so we had a lot of issues with the Taliban, but one of the main issues that we raised to them was that if uh, women couldn't go outside the house without a blood male relative, that widows are going to die at home, and nothing can be done about that. So what we convinced them to do, that to allow us to do, was to set up bakeries. And we set up bakeries in each of the major cities in Afghanistan, and those bakeries were run by women for widows. And we were able to keep those bakeries running uh, and be able to serve widows in this very, um, uh, obviously, very desolate kind of place. But we, that, this was a worker at a bakery. And, uh, and she um, is bringing out this bread. This would be what, one, what each woman could take home that day. And uh, huge lines of women uh, at these bakeries that came in uh, to be able to uh, sustain themselves. It was extremely successful, and, uh, and women um, um, in all the major cities had access to that bakery. Even during the uh, US-UK bombing in, two, in uh, October 2001, uh, the bakeries kept going. And on the rare days when they couldn't, then they'd give the flour to the women. And, and, uh, and the women would be able to keep, uh, keep this bread. We had a lot of issues, a lot of pulls and tugs um, uh, with the Taliban, but ultimately we were able to, uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't do much about the girls in school, but at least we could, we could uh, reach, reach women in, in this way. 
but the um, the transportation was is, is an issue too in Afghanistan, and uh, and the, the remoteness even of the of the uh, of of the country and of, of many of the uh, many of the villages and places where people live. So when after September 11th, when we had to rush very quickly to figure out now what are we going to do, uh, and when we realized that there was going to be a focus on Afghanistan, we worked to try to open up the um, uh, the different uh, routes to be able to move food into um, Afghanistan. Up until then, we really only used Pakistan routes. And if you see Quetta, excuse me here, but to see Quetta here, there was a route this way, and there was a route in Peshawar, from Islamabad Peshawar in that way. Those were the two major ways that we got um, food inside uh, Afghanistan. But we could see if there was going to be fighting in Afghanistan and, and not knowing exactly what would happen, but assuming something was going to happen, which ended up being the UK, uh, US uh, um, bombing, we had to do something to be able to get food into the country, especially because once it's wintertime, a lot of the uh, roads would be blocked. And we had to be able to get food into the mountains and uh, get food throughout the country. So we, we did several, uh, we were open several other routes, one from Iran on, on the western side, and move food from Iran into Pakistan. We had a lot of food there, or prepositioned in the region because of the drought. So, um, so we didn't have to wait a long time for food to arrive. And the Iranian food was tricky, though, because uh, moving through through Iran was tricky because it was American food. So we had to negotiate with the Iranians and with the Americans to be able to do this. And meanwhile, you know, the American food bags have big American flags on them. Um, and uh, so um, anyway, we rebagged. We put the American bags in additional bags. And, sent, and that was the way the Iranians allowed the food through, and the Americans didn't mind uh, having that done. So we opened up route through Iran. Then we opened up route through the north, um, Uzbekistan. There was, there was a big facility there uh, on the border, but the Uzbeks had closed the border once the Taliban took over. So not just us, but the State Department and others were negotiating with the Uzbeks to open that border so we could use that for a positioning point to move food in that way through. Too. Um, we had the mountains to, to, that were issues, and somebody told me that we hired an Arctic expert to tell us how to move, best move food through, through the mountains. And I said, well, what's the definition of an Arctic expert? And they, of course, I don't have to ask this today here in uh, Ann Arbor, but uh, uh, they, they said, well, a Canadian. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so we found all different ways to move food um, in through the country uh, and be able to... Um, be able to get food uh, inside. Now, um, uh, it became uh, obviously um, then important beyond this to be able to get food um, even to uh, health centers um, and, uh, and then ultimately, once the Taliban left, to girls in school again. Now, why beyond keeping people alive and beyond battling with the Taliban, and by the way, one day, the Taliban spokesman. If you read this thing about some guy who's now at Yale, right, mm -hmm. who was the Taliban, yeah. some of you, yeah, and he was the Taliban spokesman. Well, he, 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 for those of you who haven't read it, he was the spokesman for the Taliban. They, he had good English, so they'd send him around to, you know, be the spokesperson for the Taliban. And came to Washington one time, and he was quoted in the Washington Post as complaining about everybody trying to tell them what to do. And it was before they blew up the Buddhas. Uh, and he was complaining that UNESCO was telling him that they couldn't blow up those Buddhas. And he was complaining that the World Food Program was telling him that they had to get food to women and girls. And he said, we might as well call them the Women's Food Program, <laughs> which I thought would be fine if they wanted to do that. Um, but, well, why was this important um, beyond the fighting with the Taliban, beyond keeping people alive? And that is because um, it was critical to the anti-terrorism effort to... Um, be able to um, um, do, have the military campaign in Afghanistan, and I'm uh, not a shill for the military campaign, but to say obviously that was the next uh, step that the U.S. government in the U.K. Um, had to take, but we had to keep people alive then too, and and uh, it when we did, um, it was certainly known and recognized. I have a picture in my office at. Uh, uh, at the university 
uh, of sitting at a, at a meeting with uh, President Bush, Kofi Annan, um, Colin Powell, um, Andrew Natsios, who was head of USAID at the time, and other UN agency heads because the president invited us to thank us for the work we were doing in Afghanistan. This was November of 2001. Uh, and, and the same month, when I was in London to appear before a, um, a uh, committee meeting of the um, House of Commons, uh, I got a phone call to say, please go to number 10 Downing Street. And so I went to meet the minister, uh, the development minister at number 10 Downing Street. But really, the reason why is that she set up a meeting for me with the prime minister because he wanted to say thank you for what we were doing. And he had he had charts that he had been given every day as part of his briefing of how much food was delivered that day in Afghanistan by the World Food Program, a daily chart about how, how we had done. And, and then finally, when we visited in uh, Islamabad in February of 2002 and met with President Musharraf, he said to me, you were, you were, um, UWFP, were brave and creative and imaginative, and you are the reason why I didn't have a lot of refugees at my doorstep. Because you remember a lot of the concern was that people, refugees may leave in large numbers and cross the border, and that didn't happen. And um, he, he said the reason why it didn't happen is because we fed people inside Afghanistan and it caused him less of a problem on his border. And I know we were, um, we did some things we weren't supposed to do, some t uh, and because sometimes we got our hands slapped by different other UN bodies, but uh, we were able to um, get food in. And uh, somebody said to me once when I was explaining this, well, yes, yeah, so you helped the bombing. Well, uh, I think it's I think it's very hard to argue, and I, I would not be one to argue that it, that it was wrong for the U.S. and the U.K. to uh, to conduct that operation, uh, and uh, and and this. Um, uh, but at the same time, we had to keep we had to keep people alive, and we were able to do that um, by this humanitarian action in what Meniere and and uh, Hazel Smith call humanitarian diplomacy. And it is that diplomacy that this different kind of diplomacy that I think is what we will see more of in uh, in the world um, in the future. Um, it's not going to replace the um, traditional dip diplomatic routes, uh, but it's critically important that we stay focused on saving lives and at the same time how that action is going to play out in the future, how it's going to help uh, people survive today, but how it's going to help build societies that can survive in the future and peace that can survive forever. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Heather. Yeah, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the kinds of relationships you developed with indigenous NGOs in the places where both of the program works and how those contribute to the long run goal as you focused on. Um, yes, indig um, there are thousands, literally thousands of local NGOs with whom WFP works, uh, as well as UNICEF and the other uh, agencies as well. And they are critical to building sustaining operations. Uh, none of us should be operating, even in an emergency setting, without building the base for sustainability in the future. So for instance, the school, these uh, schools that we're sending food to, um, we've got to be able to help build a capacity through mothers or through uh, local U or, or, uh, NGOs and other organizations to help keep those programs going in the future. So there, there are quite a lot of partnerships. The, also, there, one of the things that happened in the last 10 years with the uh, World Food Program and with UNHCR is developing much closer relationships with international NGOs and having memorandum, memorandums of understanding with them so that you don't start from scratch in every country. So the, the people in Afghanistan don't have to create the relationship because one already exists on paper. And those would be with the, with the big organizations like Save the Children and Care and World Vision and Catholic <coughs> Relief Services and others. But the local ones are, are, are essential, can't operate without them. And most of these operations of the UN 
um, are not retail operations. They're wholesale operations, and the local NGOs are the retailers in terms of the actual relationships with people and the distribution. Yes. Thank you very much for the enlightening uh, you know, the three hotspots that you mentioned. What are the other hotspots in the area around the world that you feel uh, some of these innovative means of reaching out to the people need to be I was I was trying to think of some current ones, and I, I, I was falling short. I mean, Darfur is the biggest tragedy uh, that exists, and it's it's deplorable that it's not uh, been able to be uh, handled in any reasonable way by the international community. So it's pretty hard to have any kind of diplomacy um, with with whom. Um, uh, and until the international community gets its act together and gets some uh, peacekeepers there, or, and gets the government of Sudan to um, be responsible, uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, to literally do anything. So that's, that's problematic. Tsunami was a huge uh, and potentially you know, was able to build some relationships. Um, Banda Aceh, uh, 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 Band Band Aceh. Band I, it is, it is an area where perhaps it's more peaceful now as a result of the terrible tragedy. Um, and uh, the influx of humanitarian workers as a result. Uh, but uh, that being a natural disaster, it's probably not as many um, uh, overlaps. So uh, anything you can think of? I, uh, I was thinking of Haiti, for example. Mm. I mean, that's been a long-standing issue for many decades, if nothing yeah. else, and it's in the Western Hemisphere, yeah. uh, which uh, to me, I, I think is a shame for both North and South America. Yes, well, Haiti could potentially be an example of, I mean, maybe the humanitarians can come forward in a way in Haiti and say, look, these social issues are really going to, unless they're solved, we're never going to solve the broader issues in Haiti because that is the base of the, of the problems. But, of course, that's a lot easier to say than to do. Yes? I was struck by your um, introductory remark that there's been a fourfold increase in the number of natural disasters mm -hmm. in what, the last 15 years mm -hmm. or so. Right. Um, how is that reality uh, working diplomatically both with, um, with developing countries and the overdeveloped technological countries? Because you know, that, that's a human-made phenomenon, both in terms of deforestation, I assume, and in terms of global warming. And, you know, variety and population and things like that. How, you know, how can the nations of the world from both sides um, begin to deal with that? Well, first, as far as, as droughts, for instance, um, there, there, there's um, a man, a prominent man in Kenya named Richard Leakey, Dr. Leakey, um, and uh, he had a position for a while in the Moy government as uh, uh, kind of senior cabinet official in charge of weeding out corruption. I mean, that's not, it was, that's not exactly the title, obviously, but uh, the World Bank and the IMF cut off the government, said you're too corrupt unless you fix something. We're not going to do anything. So they convinced Leakey, who was opposition member, to be, they give this broad portfolio. And he did, by the way, he did a lot of things, good things. And then once World Bank and the IMF came back, Moy fired him. But, uh, um, he said, he, so I, he was the guy I interacted with, one of the guys I interacted with in Kenya during the 2000 drought in the Horn of Africa. And he said droughts are like African winters um, because they happen here uh, periodically. And just like you have snow and cold. And you've figured out a way to deal with it. And we haven't figured out a way yet to really deal with the drought, which keeps coming over and over again. So, um, so one issue is that and the, uh, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan tried to have some people kind of think that through, but it didn't, it didn't get very far. But there have been several, several pieces of that, little pieces. For instance, um, WFP, since my departure, is now got um, in Ethiopia has um, kind of drought insurance. They pay, I don't know, Lloyds of London or somebody, some money. And if, if uh, uh, the production goes down so far, um, then they'll be paid on their insurance policy. Uh, the uh, Ethiopians and some others have pretty sophisticated um, food bank um, uh, systems now run by the government. 
and sophisticated uh, transport systems. So these don't answer the question, but there's little pieces here and there that are going to, well, how do we deal with droughts? But the bigger issue is droughts happen no matter what. Global warming or nothing, they're droughts. How are we going to deal with it? So there are more people starting to think about it, but not a lot of, of, of answers. Um, the, the, the flood issues are, are early warning, both drought and floods, there's early warning um, it, technical issues that could be fixed that just need the uh, money in order to, and the priority to do them. Um, and there are varying degrees of people's interest uh, to do something about it. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's kind of on the agenda, but it's not very high up on anybody's agenda to deal with these issues. In North Korea, uh, deforestation was clearly an, an issue because uh, when the weather was bad, um, the hills would, would fall in. In fact, in, in Hurricane Mitch, remember Hurricane Mitch, and was that 99? Um, that, was, that was one of the issues, that, that it just rained so much that the hills came down and, and then uh, went into the riverbanks and then the rivers flooded. So not only did the villagers get buried, um, also then people living along the rivers got buried. If you go on the border of North Korea and China, and you know, put on a blindfold and go like this, and then you look out, and somebody says, "Are you looking at China and North Korea?" Or North Korea, you can tell in a flash because the China side's got is loaded with trees, and the North Korea sides are are bare. Yes, I have a couple comments. First, uh, part of the food problem in East Africa, Tanzania, was they introduced the idea of wheat and farming, which did not work when they had these floods and they had land massive erosion. So they had to separately change the technique. And as it was Dr. Leakey, he's better known as for his ability to find early man in the Altabai Gorge. Yeah, that's true. Uh, another thing, as regards Southwest Africa, the former German colony, the only major town is Windhoek, and the only port is Valdez Bay. Now, after the First World War, South Africa got that as a colony. The main tribe, I believe, is the Hereros. In terms of the characteristics of the country, it has enormous quantities of diamonds. And its coast, uh, which has no harbor, is known as the Skeleton Coast. Because of the fog and ships going aground, you may find years later a ship that had sunk high inland, several miles inland. It is also rather interesting that people tried to get into this area to collect diamonds. And they got the technique of salvaging from the sea. Hmm. So it's rather interesting what happens as a guard tip. Now, the railways. South Africa has a three foot six gauge. That was extended between the wars into Southwest Africa. The reason that was to uh, um, get at the diamonds and other things. Now, it is also, as you know, the Kalahari Desert from Botswana land goes near the coast. And it's a rather interesting phenomenon. Because the land is so hot, you find a stream of vegetation along the coast which is get the salt from the sea because the cooling of the air and the heating of the air cause the current to come in and do drops on vegetation and creates a crop. And this in turn allows microbe insects to uh, survive. Well, I, you have far more knowledge about the region and the history uh, and the geography than I do. Geography oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's true. But yes, and Dr. Leakey, yes, that he he's not known for being a super minister of the government. Kennedy. that was one of the reasons why they brought him in because he was, you know, very highly respected, and uh, they thought he could. Be, and look, but I will tell you one little story about that. What happened with with him uh, is that. Um, uh, he, one thing he, he let us do, in, this is in the drought in the Horn of Africa in, in um, 2000, was he essentially cut out the local governments as the middlemen between what the World Food Program was sending in and the distribution. And, uh, and uh, so we had a much, actually much more efficient than usual process. And I, I knew this separately from what we could observe because the, um, Stanley Fisher, who was the deputy of the IMF, said to me at one point, gee, we had all these, these loans available for Kenya that I asked them why they didn't use them because of the drought. 
And I asked them why they didn't use them for the drought, because we otherwise weren't, you know, weren't helping them. And uh, they said it's because WFP was so much more efficient this year than they were last year. Well, <laughs> it wasn't that we were efficient, it's that you know, we didn't have to lose the food in the, on the way. And that's one of the kind of things Leakey did for us. It was really good. So can I say something about the role of the UN in this? Because clearly, individual countries have long used food assistance as a form of diplomacy, both a threat as well as uh, you know, a promise. And there are also there are large numbers of NGOs out there who do this. You know, what, what is it that you could do in the UN that was particularly important or unique that made, you know, made your role different than the role of other groups that were delivering humanitarian assistance? Well, first of all, the UN, the UN agencies, World Food Program, UNICEF, UN High Commission for Refugees, and of course OCHA representing the UN Secretariat, we are representing 192 countries when we do something. So, um, so the, that gives a, it's, it's different than Save the Children that's representing the donors and the board of directors of Save the Children in the US. Uh, it gives you more um, gravitas, I guess, in, in terms of the, the negotiating, your negotiating ability. Uh, it, 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 it brings you, it opens up more doors in the government, in the, inside the country. Uh, and uh, it gives you really more credibility. You don't have to build your own credibility and uh, because you, you have it along with the UN's credibility, which is pretty high in most of these countries, not every place, but most places. So, so that, it, you, you, you bring that and it's, it's a big plus. Also, you're bigger than any other NGOs, WFP or UNICEF or UNHCR, and you're also the lead. So for instance, if it's a food issue, WFP would do the assessment and everyone else would rely on that assessment. They may do their own kind of micro assessment, but if, if CARE is gonna to go to, to the State Department and say please fund, or the AID and say please fund this project, it's gonna be based in part on what WFP said the need is. And the same for UNICEF, it's a, it's a UNICEF type project, and, and particularly true for refugees because UNHCR is the refugee uh, um, um, arbiter in terms of what's needed. And you, so if you go ask, you and NGO go ask for, for aid, it's, it's to support the UNHCR objective. So, uh, so that's basically the, the, the standard. And one of the things I think we did at, at, at WFP during my tenure was to make WFP the food aid agency and, and put it kind of in that UNHCR league in terms of, you know, these are the first ones that know what's going on and then everything else flows from there. Now, if there were an NGO CEO next to me, he may, he may not exactly agree with that description, but that's the way I see it. I say he, because I think except for care, they all are he's. Uh, yes? Um, you mentioned the refugee program, and many of your programs are trying to build in sustaining uh, infrastructure. Right. Tell me more about the refugee program that just has to pour in year after year after year because these people have no way of doing anything but waiting to go someplace else. Yes, uh, there are unfortunately too many uh, situations where there's, uh, refugees can't go home and, um, and uh, they have a hard time being placed somewhere else. Although I don't know the statistics, but I think it's, it's far less now than it was, for instance, 10 years ago. Uh, when you think about the crises, I mean, Eastern Europe, there are not many, I don't think, refugees left in Eastern Europe. Yeah, there are, Near East. Uh, well, there's the issue of the Palestinians, Palestinian uh, which is uh, still an issue, and there's a whole agency in order to deal with the Palestinian refugee program. So they, it's a huge social service agency. About 25,000 Palestinians work there running hospitals and schools and, um, you know, and, and housing areas. Uh, and. Um, I think besides the fact that people are still living in temporary uh, uh, situations and they have children and maybe even grandchildren that are in, in, in living in, in these kind of regions or areas, um, the biggest problem for them is funding because donors say, when is this going to stop? All of these agencies, the refugee agencies, UNRWA, the Palestinian Refugee Agency, the World Food Crime, program UNICEF are all funded by voluntary contributions. They don't get funding from UN dues even though they're UN agencies. So they're the same as NGOs. They get some funding from governments and they get some funding from, um, um, from private individuals. Uh, 
uh, and uh, so they, they're always reliant on that. And, and although that's a problem, for instance, in many long-term refugee cases, I think it makes those agencies better than the assessed agencies. So in, in my experience, the UN Secretariat and other agencies that are funded strictly by dues are lazier about um, keeping up with changes and in, in internal um, improvements than I, I'm, I'm on purpose not using the word reform because I don't mean you know, reform the whole place, but I mean just keeping, keeping efficient and, and, and effective. But the voluntary funded agencies have to because if you don't, you lose your, your, your potentially you lose your funding. <laughs> No, it's all voluntary. Well, well, it's the UN, UNRWA, UN Relief and Works Agency, which is the UN agency set up to support the Palestinian refugees. And they are throughout the region, yes, but, um, but they're funded voluntarily by governments like US government and many others. It's not with dues paid to the UN. So it's UN, but it's funded differently. Now, Lebanon, there's a separate program in, programs in Lebanon because of the, the most recent uh, um, fighting in Lebanon. Kathy, maybe one last question. Okay. Did, did, yes. Oh, we have a student. Can I go that way? Do you mind? Thanks. I was wondering if you have an opinion on um, flags and labels on you know, various humanitarian diplomatic efforts. Um, it's often came up in a terrorism class that while we do, uh, from the United States perspective, give massive aid, some, it's undermined sometimes with the flag. I was wondering if you had an opinion about that. Uh, I don't think aid is undermined with the flag. Um, I think the flag is a way to uh, make sh to to the, the donor feels good about labeling what uh, it's giving and the um, the people on the other end can see where it's coming from. Of course in North Korea the government told people that when they saw Japanese flags or American flags it was war reparations. Um, but uh, uh, but I, 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 don't, I don't see any problem with it. I, I don't think that they should get really carried away with it. And the European uh, Union, sometimes in my time, got really carried away with having to label virtually everything. And uh, 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 one time I was visiting Angola and the country director said, uh, see that... Uh, Jeep over there, said, yeah, and it had an EU sign on the door. And he said, USAID bought that Jeep. Oh, well, okay. And I said, why does it have the, well, because they bought it and gave it to CARE, and CARE got some funding from the EU, and the EU insists anybody that has any funding has on all their vehicles their stars. So, uh, you know, I mean, it can get, it, it can get kind of too silly. And, and also, I think one of the issues sometimes in UN coordination is that, that even though we struggle for money all the time, that we've got more money than the people and the governments that we're helping. Maybe Rwanda after the genocide, you know, we were there. rushing around in our new vehicles. We had chipped in because the other ones had been destroyed or stolen. Uh, and UNICEF was there and you know we were setting up our fax machines and Xerox machines and in our office because our offices were all had been shot up and everything. Well, same thing had happened to the government offices, but nobody was there setting up, helping the government and bringing in vehicles for them and p putting in, you know, equipment for them to be able to get started again. So I think sometimes we forget that and, and, and we forget that uh, we, re we really have to, have to be there to, to first and foremost make sure there's a functioning infrastructure <coughs> to essentially put ourselves out of business. Uh, the labels themselves, um, I don't. Uh, I don't have too much of a problem with. In fact, we would make a point of taking pictures of labels, of, you know, of, and sending them back to donors so they could see how they were, how they were being used, and and um, and what they were doing. But essentially, it was pretty successful. Can, can I take one more, yeah, boss? I was going to ask about the Iraqi refugees. I was just hearing that. Those who went to Jordan can't be in school, and that this is public schools, and that this is. Um, Iraqi refugees, um, there are, even before the, the uh, current war in Iraq, there were a lot of refugees from Iraq outside of Iraq. Uh, 
I visited some in Iran, for instance. Iran actually hosts a lot of refugees from, or, or did, from both Iran, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, uh, the, um, so there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of, all, from all region, um, Iraqis outside. The refugees, no matter where, um, offer a lot of challenges for the host populations. Uh, because um, they they need housing, um, and, and uh, they need to be able, they need food they need, they need schools for the children all of these things and there's always frictions um, between them even if it's a it's a it's a more basic situation like uh, Rwandan refugees moving to um, moving across the border to Tanzania and needing firewood, so cutting down a lot of the forests in Tanzania and the people weren't very pleased. The food coming in to support the refugees, which is a better deal than the poor people that live in that area of Tanzania were getting. Uh, so the tensions, you know, the tensions mount. Then when there's long-term issues, they presumably people have housing and food, but then there's issues like schools and hospitals, and then there's tensions that, that, that build in there. How do, you, how do you sustain that? The international community expects the local, the, the host, government to be able to find to provide those facilities but sometimes they don't and then UNHCR in this case would have to be uh, would have to be being very diplomatic with the government of Jordan to be able to convince them to try to um, try to accommodate those refugees and it's uh, it's not always um, it's not always very successful but um, but it is it is uh, a, a real challenge uh, over the long term to be able to to be able to sustain um, lives, essentially, especially when it's generation after generation after generation. <coughs> so I thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be back. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always good to have you back at the Ford School. I want to invite everyone to join us for a small reception outside these doors. And if you want to stay and talk with Kathy or those of you who know her, meet her again, um, please join us.